Hey guys, this is Leah with Prevailing Word Publishing and I'm really glad that you were able to join me today and uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about what uh, God has been dealing with me in the last couple of years. I mean, he's dealt with me about it quite a bit, but especially in the last couple of years, ever since uh, COVID and all of this is, has been going on. And um, anyway, what I want to talk to you today about is um, profits. Profits, okay? Um, God placed it upon my heart to do this pamphlet. It's called Profits, a guide to discerning the true and the false. Okay, what did, what did Pilate uh, ask Jesus? He said, what is truth? Isn't that what we all want to know today, okay? And what I want to do is I want to go back in the scriptures and I want to talk to you just a little bit today about what a true prophet is and what a true prophet looks like, okay? But the thing that I want you to keep in mind is, okay, is not to take my word for it, okay? But over in Acts 17 and 11, okay, it talks about these guys at, at Berea, the Bereans, okay? And it says in Acts 17, 11, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, right? Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So, I'm going to present some scriptures to you today, and I'm going to present what the Holy Spirit has revealed to me about this, and I urge you not to take my word for it, but to get into the word and allow the word to get into you and figure it out for yourselves. Allow that Holy Spirit to speak to you about what is being presented today, okay? Because he wants to lead us and guide us into all truth, right? He wants to show us things to come, John 16, 13, okay? So, the modern day um, definition of a prophet. Okay, when I say the word prophet, what most people think about is an office or calling upon someone's life in which their sole responsibility is to foretell future events, right? I mean, come on, that's really what we think about when we, we hear about a prophet's going to come to town or, or you see something on YouTube or Rumble or whatever and it's about prophets, they're usually foretelling the future, right? They're telling you about things to come or this or that, whatever the case would be, okay? But I want to go back to the Bible, okay? And we're going to do a little word study on the word prophet, okay? The first usage of a word in the Bible, okay? I know the Bible's not chrono chronologically in order, but the first usage of a word in the Bible usually holds 75% of the meaning. Did you know that? Okay, so we're going to look at the first usage of the word prophet, and we're going to find that in Genesis 20, verse 7, okay? And in Genesis 20, verse 7, this is God himself, speaking to Abimelech, okay, concerning Abraham, okay? And this is what it says in Genesis 20, verse 7, if you're following along. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he, talking about Abraham, is a prophet. That is the very first usage of the word prophet in the Bible, okay? God himself is speaking, declaring Abraham to be a prophet. And it says, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Okay? Now, isn't it very interesting that the first usage of a word prophet is actually God declaring himself that someone is a prophet. Okay? So whenever I seen this, I was like, hmm, well, that's pretty interesting. I think we need to go back and we need to study Abraham's prophecies. Okay? God gave Abraham lots of word. Okay? There was many, many times that God spoke to Abraham over and over and over and over. You know, he said, in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply. I'm going to bless those that bless you, I'm going to curse those that curse you. And he says over in Genesis 22 and 17, thy seed shall possess the gates of thine enemies. Okay? God over and over was speaking to Abraham. But I want you to get back in the word Study it for yourselves, I challenge you, and find out how many times that Abraham actually went out here according to the Bible. That's what we're talking about. No other book here. According to the Bible. You study for yourself Abraham's prophetic words. How many times he went out here and he prophesied? Very few and far between, okay? And I cover that in this pamphlet, okay? So I urge you, get in contact with us. If you want a hard copy of it, we can mail those to you. We actually have a few churches that have wanted to take these on and do uh, small group studies and home group studies. So, um, but we want you to know the truth, okay? And it's all free. You can actually get on our website and you can get it for yourself too. So we have a free copy there, okay? But 
Abraham's prophecies were short and simple. I'm going to give you an example of one of Abraham's prophecies, okay? Whenever him and Isaac were going up and they were going to do their worship and their offering, okay? And um, he told the two men that were with him, he said over here in Genesis 22 and 5, he told these two men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and we will worship and we will return to you. He gave a prophetic word that he, they were both going to return to these two men, okay? Very short, very sweet. It was a prophecy to two people, okay? And another passage in the very, very next thing here that happens in Genesis 22, 7 and 8, Isaac asked him, he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham responds, God will provide, okay? Well, whenever you tell somebody something, you know, sometimes, and you say, well, God will provide, many people wouldn't receive that as a prophecy. But that's what Abraham said. Short, simple, to the point, and not directed towards a big bunch of people, okay? Yet God himself declared Abraham to be a prophet, okay? Now, I want to bring this to your attention again, okay? Um, over in Amos 3, 7, it says this, Certainly the Lord does nothing unless he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets, right? Well, we find that truth here in uh, Genesis 18 and 17. The Lord said this, okay? Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Right? Because he said he's not going to do anything except he first reveal it to his servants, the prophets. Well, what was he getting ready to do? He was getting ready to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I mean, that's what the Bible says. So, he revealed to Abraham what he was going to do. And we know he revealed that to him because Abraham said, oh, wait, what if there's 50 in the land? What if there's 45 in the land? It goes on and on and on. And God said, yeah, I'm going to spare him. Yeah, I'm going to spare him. But let me ask you a question. Did Abraham prophesy what was about to happen? He did not. He did not prophesy that. I don't believe it was God's will for him to prophesy that. So sometimes... Just because something is revealed does not mean that it is supposed to be revealed to a big bunch of people. Sometimes God just puts things in our heart to pray about these situations, okay? All right, let's look at the second usage of the word prophet in the, in the Bible, okay? Exodus 7, 1, it says this, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. Well, hello, how can one person be another person's prophet, Okay. All right, let's go on down here, Exodus. We have to go back just a little bit here to Exodus 4, verse 13 to find this answer. It says this, God here is again speaking to Moses, and he declares this. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what to say. But he, Moses, said, Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. He did not feel qualified, did he? So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well. And look, he is coming out to meet you, getting ready to have this divine appointment. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, now, right? Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he, Aaron, shall be your spokesman to the people, okay? And he himself shall be a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as a God. So here we actually learn that the interpretation of the word prophet is a spokesman for God. It is a mouthpiece for God. God spoke to Moses. Moses did not feel confident in himself, so God provided a mouthpiece, and that was Aaron. So that is a spokesman for the Word of God. I cannot emphasize that enough. For the Word of God. Not man's words, but God's words, okay? Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are not my own, but my Father who sent me, okay? So a true prophet is going to be speaking the Word of God, okay? How is a true prophet born? A true prophet is born of the Spirit and of the Word, okay? I love the way that Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 in the Amplified reads concerning prophets, okay? It says, And his gifts were varied. He, talking about God, appointed and gave men to us, and some to be apostles, which are special messengers, some prophets. Now listen to this, because this, this is a word study in itself in the Greek. 
It says that prophets are inspired preachers and expounders. It's inspired preachers and expounders of the Word of God, okay? And it goes on and says some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers, okay? But it says this is the intention of these prophets. I, I'm emphasizing the prophetic here, okay? His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints. So he put these prophets in order, which are inspired preachers and expounders of the word of God, for the perfecting and full equipment of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering toward building up of Christ's body, the church. I mean, come on, that is the purpose for these prophets. They're to build up the body of Christ, okay? In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says here, So God appointed some in the church for his own use. For his own use, okay? The prophets are for his own use. First apostles, the special messengers, and second, the prophets. Remember, inspired preachers and expounders, okay? They are inspired preachers and expounders, okay? They are going to dig deep into the word of God and bring out truth. They have a respect for God and his word. That's what a true prophet does, okay? All right, I want, to, I want you to go back here. This was something very powerful that God placed in my heart here. Qualifications of the true prophet. Go back to Ezekiel. I'm not going to read the whole thing here because I'm running short on time. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and then 3, 1 through 4, okay? What happened here? Okay, there was a scroll, and Ezekiel was told, eat it, and then he spoke. Eat the word, speak the word. Eat the word, speak the word. For why? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The more word that you have in you, the more you're going to be able to speak the word of God and speak it faithfully. Faithfully, okay? So that is the first qualification here of a, of a true prophet is you eat the word and you speak the word. You eat the word and you speak the word, okay? Over in Jeremiah, Verses, uh, chapter 15, verse 16, Jeremiah said, Thy word was found, and I ate it. I ate it. And then it says, And your words became a joy to me and a delight of my heart. Right? So what did Jeremiah do? He ate the word. Then he spake the word. He ate it and he spake it. He ate it and he spake it. And that's what true prophets do. They keep themselves built up on the word of God. That's their foundation. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. I believe he was talking about himself, the word of God. And he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Because it's his spoken word that's going to do more than these idle, inoperative words that man can speak. Nothing is more powerful than the word of God. Okay, here's another example. John the Revelator. We're living in the days of revelation. I, I hope you believe that. If you don't, I urge you. I urge you to get in the Word of God and pray and seek it out for yourself, okay? John the Revelator says in Revelation 10 through 11, I'm going to read this one. It says, but that when the days come... When the trumpet call of the seventh angel is about to be sounded, then God's mystery, his secret design, his hidden purpose, as he had, please notice that this is past tense, okay? He had announced the glad tidings to his servants, who? The prophets, okay? That they should be fulfilled, accomplished, and completed. The prophetic word in is, is his word, and he has already given it to the prophets, Okay, it's already, this word has already been given to us. It's all in Revelation. That's what it is. It's a prophetic word given to John the Revelation, Revelator. If this is true, then why are we looking for a new prophecy? What we need is revelation of what is already written. Because it was written for our learning. It was written for our learning, okay? We don't need to be run into this one and that one and all like this, but these words were written for our learning, this prophecy. And God, he, he will not withhold any good thing from you if you want to know. We should want to know. He said, a hungry heart, I'm going to fill it. We're going to go on here. It says, it says, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, go, take the little book. The scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea in the land. So I went up to the angel and asked him to give me the little book. And he said, take it and eat it. Take it and eat it. 
It will embitter your stomach, though in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. So I took the little book from the angel's hand and I ate it and I swallowed it. And guess what? Now we have Revelation. The book of Revelation. Because John the Revelator ate the word and then he gave the prophecy. It's already there. We need a revelation of his word. We need deeper revelations. It said to me it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but once I had swallowed it, my stomach was embittered. Then they said to me, you are to make a fresh prophecy concerning many peoples and races and nations and languages and kings. I am very thankful that John the Revelator ate the scroll. I'm very thankful for that. And he gave us this prophetic word, okay? And there is no more sure word of prophecy. And we're going to get into that here in a minute. When you think about this, there's no separation from between the written word and the living word. John 1 and 14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus himself, okay? Revelation 19, 13, I'm going to read this one. It says, he is clothed, right? It's talking about Jesus. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name, his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God, okay? Now, taking this all into context, we're going to bring it to a head here. Jesus told us in John 6, 55 through 58. He said this himself, For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh, remember these are the true prophets, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me remains in me and I in him just as the father sent me and I live because of the father the one who eats me he will also live because of me this is the bread that came down out of heaven not as the fathers ate and died but the one who eats this bread will live forever okay we're talking about eating the word and speaking the word eating the word and speaking the word not these useless inoperative words but we're talking about the word of God okay the word of God. Anything that man could do in his own flesh, it profits nothing. Jesus said over in John 6 and 63, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. He said the words that I speak to you, to you, they are spirit and they are more certainly life. Praise God. Know for sure that true prophets will be persecuted. In 2 Timothy 3, 12, it says this, Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted okay and john or excuse me luke 6 and 26 it says woe to you when all men speak well of you for so did their fathers of whom the false prophets the false prophets you go back and i challenge you to read the old testament okay it was the false prophets that were in in an enormous amount okay jezebel's prophets you know they stood against elijah right and uh, ahab's prophets they stood um they stood against M micaiah you know what i'm saying it was one against so many prophets all these guys were speaking this but that's a, that's a type and shadow of the remnant. A remnant is small in number. But I'm going to tell you what, the remnant is going to stand for the true word of God. And that's what I want to encourage you today. The sole purpose of this teaching is that you will get into the word of God and allow the word of God to get into you. And you will seek these things out. And you will not just receive any word that is spoken. Even though there might be a scripture here and there. But you will need to get into the word and seek it out for yourself to find out what is true and what is not okay all right all right let's go on to down here god does not want us listening to false prophets listen to this jeremiah 23 and 16 says this thus says the lord of hosts do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you they make you what worthless false prophets will make you worthless they speak a vision of their own heart and not from the mouth of the lord why would you want to be listening to that why would you want to be listening to that? I want to talk to you just a moment for about a true prophetic word and what that really is, okay? Revelation 19.10 reads this way. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified because it, it adds a little more expounding here of the, the word studies, okay? It says, Revelation 19.10 again, For the substance, the essence of truth revealed by Jesus is the spirit of all prophecy. The vital breath, the inspiration of all inspired preaching and interpretation of the divine will and purpose, including both mine and yours. Okay, so I'm going to just break this down in layman's terms, okay? What does this mean? It means the sum, 
of all prophecy is somehow regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Where he is, what he's doing, what is his plan, what's, he, what's, what's happening with this kingdom that's to come and his will being done. Okay, everything is adding up. This plus this equals the sum. Jesus is the sum of all prophetic utterances. Okay, all right. There is no more sure word of prophecy than the word of God itself, okay? In 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, it says this, we have, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What's it talking about? The word of God. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and a day star arise in your heart, knowing this first, that no scripture of prophecy is of any in private interpretation. That's idios in the Greek. Look it up for yourself what that means. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. True prophetic words do not come from the will of man, but by holy men of God, who spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you what, a true prophet is going to have a baptism of the Holy Spirit too. Okay? So, the Word of God is the most reliable prophecy that you'll ever, ever hear. If something does not line up with the Word of God, you need to throw it out. There is so much deception going on these days, and God does not want you to see over and over in His Word. He said, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, okay? All right. It says over in 1 Corinthians 14, and three, it says, but he who prophesies, he speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Prophecies spoken from God will edify, and they will exhort, and they will comfort people. There may be a harsh reality with it, but there will be still be some edification, exhortation, and comfort with a true prophetic word, according to Second Peter one and twenty. Or excuse me, according to First Corinthians fourteen and three. Um, one time, I was talking to this person. Um, and um, we were talking about prophetic words. And this person was telling me about all these prophecies that they were hearing and everything like this. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very quick to hear and slow to speak, okay? Because that's, that's really what God had placed in my heart for this conversation, okay? But I started just asking this person about these prophecies, just asking questions about how it lines up with the Word of God. And this person says, well, the Bible says we're not supposed to despise prophesying. So I was just like, okay, and I let it go. Well, I went back, and I want to read the whole context of what was quoted there. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21, and I'm going to read this in the Amplified. Yes, it says, do not quench or suppress or subdue the Holy Spirit. Do not spurn gifts and utterances of the prophets. Do not depreciate prophetic revelations, nor despise inspired instruction or exhortation or warning. Yeah. We're not supposed to despise true prophecy. Listen to what else it says, though. we got to read the whole context. It says this, But test and prove all things until you can recognize what is good. And then it says, To that, what is good, right? We are to hold fast. We are to hold fast. So if something doesn't line up with the Word of God, like I said, you need to throw it out, okay? I don't care if it is a prophetic word. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you need to throw it out, okay? 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, believe, do not, but not, do not believe every spirit, but try the spirits. Try the spirits, okay? It says, whether they are God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. They have gone out into the world, okay? In 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, it says, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. This is a warning to us, okay? Who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Even denying the Lord who bought them, okay? And bring upon themselves swift destruction. That's what false prophecy does. It brings upon them swift destruction. And actually, it can bring that upon you, too. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Okay? By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, as their destruction will not slumber. Okay? All right, I'm just going to give a couple more here, and uh, then we're going to go ahead and, and just let the Holy Spirit lead. Okay? I want to tell you leadership 
will use false prophets, okay? In Jeremiah 5, 31, it says, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests exercise rule at their own hands and by means of the prophets. And my people love to have it so. It says his people love to have it so. That the prophets exercising rule by the means of the priests, hello, we should be subjected unto God, right? But then it says this, but what will you do when the end comes? If you've been listening to a false prophet, what are you going to do when the end comes? That's just a question for you. You need to search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. Okay? Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to say a prayer over you guys. I do not have time to go into the whole depths. I'm hoping to do a part two on this. But... Um, I just want you to get into the Word, like I said, and allow the Word of God to get into you. And reach out to us, okay, if you want a copy of this, or um, go on our website and download it, okay, for free, okay? So I just thank you for your time today. I pray that, um, that you receive this Word, this Word with meekness, this engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. And Father, we just thank you for your presence today. I thank you for your presence upon this word. I know where two or three are gathered together that you are most certainly in the midst, Father God. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory, and all the thanks. Amen.